You know, we all have dreams. In fact, many of the best leaders are dreamers. They have a vision of a preferred future for themselves and for their teams. But what happens when the dream doesn't work out? What happens when our dreams die? Well, my guest today offers us a proven playbook for how to dream again and discover your unique calling in life. Let's jump in. Welcome to the Intentional Leader Podcast, a place to be refreshed, renewed, and encouraged as you lead yourself, your family, and your team. I'm Cal, and I'm so pumped to welcome Graham Cochran back on the show. Graham is a TEDx and keynote speaker, a seven-figure entrepreneur, and the best-selling author of How to Get Paid for What You Know, and his brand new book, Rebel, Find Yourself by Not Following the Crowd. Graham is just an inspiring guy, and I love his new book. It's no nonsense, no fluff, and it gives an amazing roadmap for how to discover your uniqueness, how to dream again, how to create a compelling vision for your life, and how to fight the negative thinking and obstacles that causes so many of us to conform and to settle for less than what God has for us. I highly recommend picking up this book. It actually releases this week as I'm releasing this episode. And on this episode, we dive into his amazing story of wanting to be a rock star, but then feeling the pressure from others and from just circumstances to conform He coaches us and he coaches me on how to dream again. We get real practical on that and why we shouldn't just let our dreams die and how we actually excavate from what's inside of that dream. And if you enjoy this discussion, I know that you'll love the book, which you can get on Amazon or you can get anywhere books are sold. You could also go to therebelbook.com to get some bonuses that he offers there. If you enjoy this episode, please share it with a friend and thank you to all of you that continue to rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I really appreciate that. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Graham Cochran. All right. Well, hey, Graham Cochran, welcome back to the Intentional Leader Podcast. I'm really, really excited to have you back on today. Yeah, I'm glad to come back. Thanks for the second invite. This is so fun for me because your brother Wes and I are dear friends all the way back to West Point someone that's in my closest circle of friends now. And then as I have progressed with this podcast, I have really gravitated more and more to your work because you really help content creators think about how to create better content, but also how to create a life around that content. And it's been cool to see you go from talking a lot to business minded people to now, and you've kind of always been this way, but you're speaking now to seems like a broader audience. You're speaking to anyone who really wants to discover their uniqueness. So it's really cool to see that. And I want to start with this question. I, I One question I like to ask people is, when was the first time they felt like a leader? But I'm going to ask you a little bit different. And I think they're kind of one and the same almost. When was the first time that you felt like a rebel? That's the name of your new book, Rebel. When's the first time you felt like that? Yeah, I feel like I've always felt like a rebel, a little bit different, but as you get older, you know, you really start to notice when people are going in in a certain direction and you're kind of the lone person going in the direction you're going and it becomes more real, more obvious. Um, So probably college for me, that season, like 18 to 22, when I just was working so clearly towards what I thought my dream was, which was to be a professional musician, to be a rock star, trying to get a record deal. And I looked around and everyone else was like, I'm just trying to get good grades and sail through school, get a safe job. And I was like, that sounds awful to me. Like, I just want to go do something interesting, something where the every day is different. Every day is creative. And as a musician, I mean, that was my skill set. So I, I felt like I was one of the few people. And I talk about it a little bit in the book, how all my, like we all had dreams as kids and all my buddies that were music buddies started to just drop like flies as we got closer to senior year. And they all wanted to become lawyers. No offense to my brother, Wes, who's an army jag, uh, <laughs> lawyers and investment bankers. And I was like, is this where we're supposed to give up our dream and, and do something totally, which seemed random to me? Cause I never heard these guys talk about, I want to practice law. I want to be an invest. We just did music. Right. So I think it was like that 17, 18 finishing high school, going into college where I realized, I think I'm the only one left. That's really trying to pursue this music dream. And I felt like, but I, but I was happy with it. I kind of, I'm a lone wolf naturally. So I was like, fine, I'm going to go do my thing. And and uh, you guys go do those boring jobs. They sound awful to me. <laughs> so, no offense if you're a lawyer or investment banker. Just it wasn't for me and it's not for me. 
Well, I think that's consistent with the theme of this book. I'm curious though. So going all the way back to, you talk about in the book, you're, you've got your, your friends, they're into music, you're all into music. And then they start saying things like, oh, I really want to be an investment banker. or I really want to be a lawyer. And you, you do seem to have this strength internally to not conform, even at that mm-hmm. age. What do you think was driving you at a, even at a young age to not not give in, not conform. Cause you also had, it seemed like you had parents who had normal jobs. As I recall, mm-hmm. you talk a little bit in the book. So what do you think even at an early age was giving you that strength internally to, to stick to your path? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think part of it is my makeup. It must just, I must just be wired this way uh, to me. And I'll, 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 I say this in the book. And so I think I'm pretty public with it, but like, my dad is a, it was like a mirror to me of like what maybe I didn't want. And I love my dad and, and, and he's even grown and we have these discussions openly, but it was very clear when I was middle school, high school age, that my dad didn't like what he did for a living. And it was just something he had to do. And he had a good job. He was West Point grad army and then worked for the government engineer, has his doctorate, incredibly smart, smartest guy I know close second is my brother at Wes, as you know, the two smart dudes And, um, and I just always felt like I was sort of the odd person out in the family. Like they were all army. They were all highly intelligent, went to great schools. And I just was more interested in being on the stage or creating something or making people laugh or whatever it was. But seeing my dad's job in particular, I remember I could tell that it wasn't anything he wanted to do, that it was just to get by. He would lament like, man, because he was a musician. He would say like, maybe I should have pursued my dream as a musician. You know, he was a singer, he was an actor, he was a trumpet player. And we have that love of music in common, but like for him, he just pushed it aside and and like had a job. And I'm grateful for the the job. Like it gave me and Wes stability. And so I I don't know how, you know, God wanted to use all those things together because I really was the beneficiary of of some of the decisions he made. But I just saw his sadness in his forties and beyond. And like, it's like, I don't want that to be me. And it was very subconscious. It wasn't like, this is a mistake. It was just like, man, I want life to get more fun. I want like, I want to be expanding in life. That seemed to be like the natural desire to be growing, expanding and learning. Cause as a kid, like everything gets more exciting. You get more opportunity and more responsibility. I didn't want it to start to shrink. And it looked like he was shrinking and I knew how powerful he was. I knew how intelligent he was and how gifted he was. And I was like, man, it feels like he just didn't have the courage or didn't feel like the circumstances allowed him to pursue it. Or maybe I know he's walked through some hard things himself. And I said, that's not going to be me. So I think maybe I got some drive from that of like, I see what could be. And I don't want that. That's not for me at least. So you had this dream of wanting to be a rock star and you also had some talent. So it's not like just this obscure (laughs) dream of like, you know, it's not like me wanting to be like an NBA star. And I'm like, okay, I can't, can't really play basketball very very well. So there was like an alignment between some of your yep. giftings and your dream. Talk to us about how that collided with your high school senior year guidance counselor. Because yeah, so- I, the reason I asked this, Graham, sorry to cut you off. The reason I asked this is because I think we all have dreams, but yeah. then at some point where it collides with something, some force, you talk about conformity. Yeah. So in, in some ways, this was you colliding with that. I'm curious to hear about it, but also to kind of, as people are listening to this, as leaders are listening to this, think about your own dream. And I'm thinking about my own dreams. And this book made me think about my dreams and how it's collided with conformity. So talk about this dream of a rock star and then you confront this college counselor or a high school yeah, counselor, I mean, excuse me. Yeah, no, no, yeah, you're right. I think all of us have dreams. That's like our default state. And it's not until it bumps up against someone who gives us a response or a look or a word or a comment that is like, tells us there's something wrong with our dream or that they don't approve of our dream. And so we rarely are we looking for approval. Like our, I think our natural default state as a kid is like, I'm going to, I want to do this. I'm going to do this until someone says no. And then we get conditioned to like need approval. Is this okay? Is this right? And for me, it was, it was senior year of high school. I'm 17 fall. And I got called into my guidance counselor's office and I had never been there before. And we walk in and it's one of those moments where like, she seems really friendly, but you could just tell that when you walk in the room that like, I think I'm in trouble. 
I just sense something. Something's off here. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but she looks approachable, but I don't think this is going to go well. And I sit down and she says, hey, you know, I brought you in here today because I just want to check and see how the college application process was going. And that's when I knew I was busted because like I, I was at a school where all my friends were furiously applying for colleges and there was like a giant cork board in the library where they would post up a card every time you got into a school. They put your name and the school you got into. And like my classmates were getting into like 10 schools, like each. You can, you can only go to one at a time. They're getting into 10 schools. So it became like this giant love me wall for all my overachieving friends and classmates. And I think I was the only kid in my grade who hadn't applied to a single school. So it's like in a, in a moment, I'm like, okay, I know what this is about. And I said, hey, I appreciate you checking in on me. But my dream after high school is to become a professional musician. I'm going to get a record deal and I'm going to try to become a rock star. And you don't need to go to college for that. And like, you could just see like the color drop out of her face. You could sense like, like even her posture went from the leaning against the chair or the desk to like that sort of power pose. Like I, I got to tell you something now kind of thing. Like it shifted and it was like, okay, I am in trouble. This isn't just a question mark. I'm definitely in trouble. And that's when she gave me the spiel. She said, Hey, you know, I think college is really important. I think it gives you more options It'll make a great plan B if this whole music thing doesn't work out, you know, very, very, you know, cynical, snarky response. And, um, and I just listened to the sales pitch and I calmly reiterated, reiterated to her like, look, I appreciate your concern, but it's just, this is, it doesn't make sense. Like what I want to do doesn't require a degree. Why would I spend four years and time and money doing something just to delay the thing I want to do? Let me just like get more reps and go do the thing. And, um, I, I say in the book, because I forget a lot of that conversation, but I'll never forget the last thing she said. She said, Graham, this school is a college prep school and we have a 100% college acceptance rate. I don't care. These were the words that got me. I don't care what you do after high school, but you will apply to a school and get into at least one school. And that was it. And that was one of those awkward moments of, of like, your innocence and your youth kind of vanishes when you realize, oh, I thought adults, parental figures, actual parents, teachers, guidance counselors were there to support us mm -hmm. and to figure out who we are and like train us up and guide us and educate us, but like set us on our path so we and help us on our journey. But I realized, oh no, there is a predetermined path in my neck of the woods as a middle-class American kid in the late 90s, early 2000s, which included going to college and getting good grades and getting a good degree so you can get a good job with benefits, mm -hmm. which isn't a bad thing, but it was like the only path that was available. And mm -hmm. they were forcing all of it. And I realized, oh, I, but I'm not wired that way. I don't even want that. What if my greatest success and achievement would come outside of the school system? Would you even consider, you don't even listen, you're not even listening to me. So that was the moment I kind of bumped up against conformity really, really clearly for the first time. When I, when I realize it's not as simple as, hey, you have a dream, everyone's going to support you in your dream. I have since had many different dreams. I've pivoted and evolved many different times. And to this day, when I say things like, you know, I want to write physical books and speak on physical stages coming from a person who's in the digital content landscape for a year, for 15 years, right? A decade and a half. Uh, people look at me with like a glazed look over their eyes. Why would you want to like speak on a stage and like write a paper book? Like, why do you want to do these? Why do you want to do that? Why do you want people aren't going to understand your dream. And so there, there needs to be, you talked about that internal strength. You need to be really clear about what you value and what you want and what joy is on the other side of this. I was talking to Chris Cook about this on his podcast recently. Like, why do you take risks for anything in life? Why, why would you risk for your dream? Well, because if there's another enough joy on the other side or potential joy, it's worth like dealing with the, the hate or the glazed over look or the discouraging comments or stares or whatever, even from family members who love you and care for you. And they're just trying best to love on you. You got to, you got to know why you want it to have the strength to go through it. That's one of the things I love about this book is you are writing on a topic that you have walked out in so many different areas. Like you, even from an early age, you're talking about your, you have a dream, you confront conformity, but it seems like you have this capacity to withstand it that many of us do not. And I know you've had starts and stops throughout your journey. And we'll hear more about that. I, this book made me think about Graham. I, as I was getting towards the end of high school, I really wanted to be a missionary. And I had gone on a few international mission trips and 
I have never felt so alive except for when I'm in another country mm. going house to house, sharing the good news. Uh, you know, just, there was something about that that just really stirred my heart. And your book made me recall that being a dream that of course, every time I was like, Hey, you know, I think, I don't think I'm going to go to college. I think I might go pack up my bags and go do international missions. Of course there was like, people are like, what do you mean? Like, so it's interesting, mm. but, and we'll get into this more, but it's interesting now when I look at where my passions still lie and just how that dream now in many ways is playing itself out in a different way, but still mm. very much present. So tell us a little bit. So you, you, you have this conversation, you do go to college. So walk yep. us out. Like there is this bump with conformity. You do go to college, but the dream is still very much there. Tell us a little bit more of the story and just kind of how it played out, uh, up until you getting a real job. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh man. I mean, it's funny how my parents, um, and I love them to death, but they, they seem to agree with my guidance counselor on all points. They're like, I think that she makes a great argument that you should probably go to college and we'll give you one more reason. We we're paying for it. We've saved up money and your grandfather saved up mm -hmm. money. So we want you to go very, they were nicer about it in their tone, but they're like, whatever you do after college is up to you. But like, we want you to go. They're making so it I kinda, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of had to, um, so I decided, you know, well, what I'll do is I'll just get a degree in music industry and audio engineering, which means I can play around in a recording studio for four years uh, while I work on my album and try to get a deal signed by the time I graduate college. So that was the plan. I had, a, to your point earlier, like, I don't think you pursue a dream when there's no, there's no data that supports that there's something to this dream for you. So whether it's like that dream was related to talent and natural abilities and giftings. And I had, I had been singing and doing music my whole life songwriting, getting the reps, doing the 10,000 hours, you know, Malcolm Gladwell kind of thing. It's like, and there was other people saying, I see this gift in you. I believe in you. And in college that was reiterated. I had a, a, a professor who was a previously a touring keyboard player with Elton John and Sammy Hagar and all these people and was now settling down and, and teaching music and songwriting. And he was like, bro, I think you have a shot at this. So let me help you any way I can. So we got a producer out of Nashville. We got session players. We made a record and we started shopping it around. And the timing was supposed, was supposed to go like this, land the record deal by spring of my senior year college so that I can propose to my then longtime girlfriend, Shay, now wife, propose to her and know that I've got a record deal with some advanced money and we can, we could start a life together after college. And, um, I got proposed, I got engaged in March that worked. Um, I had the record deals or the record out, you know, shopping around and hearing back from labels. But the problem was, is their answer was no, not interested nothing really in unique or original here. It was all these no's. And it really surprised me. Like I was really actually shocked. Not because I thought I would be huge, but I thought I had at least a shot. Like someone would take a chance and at least give me my first deal, knowing that that's in a way that's easier to get the first deal. It's harder to get the second deal because if you don't, if your song doesn't go anywhere, album doesn't go anywhere, you become like, you know, a reject in the industry. So I knew I didn't have a guaranteed future, but I at least I thought I had a shot the only offer I got was what's called a development deal, which means we like you enough to sign you, not enough to pay you. And, uh, and I was starting to realize, oh man, the writing's on the, on the wall. Like I, if I pursue this, there's no money, at least not anytime soon, but now I'm engaged. We're going to get married soon. Do I really drag Shay through this or do I kind of call it quits and realize this isn't working like I thought? And so that's what I, I decided to do. Like I kind of had, like my, I was graduated, I needed money. So I, I gave up on the music dream. I got a job at a radio station selling advertisements at Country KCY in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And uh, I literally was sitting in a cubicle, a beige cubicle with a button down shirt and a goofy tie, which is literally like the opposite of what a rock star would be. <laughs> and like, I'm like, how did I get here? Like what, this is not at all even close to what I've dreamt up, you know? And that was the beginning of a four year journey of floating um, from job to job. I sold jewelry, I sold uh, radio advertising, I sold video games, I worked at a software company. And it was like, oh, I had, like, I had no plan B. Like my plan was a plan A, you know? And there's a great book, uh, Matt Higgins, Burn the Boats, like, like don't have a plan B is his premise. Like it actually prohibits your plan A from happening. Just go all in. If you keep the back door open, like it, you won't actually fully get where you need to go. And so, that's, that's what I did. Like, even though I went to college, it was all plan a the whole time. And so I was bitter at God because I felt like he gave me the dream. 
I was embarrassed because I told everyone this is what I'm going to do. And then when they keep asking like, Hey, how's your album doing? Is it out? Is, are you on the radio yet? Like what's, are you touring? That's tough. Having to, it's just so embarrassing. And then I was just sad because I was like, well, like I, I don't like what I'm doing. I hate everything I'm doing Monday through Friday. The weekends are fine. I love being married, but like, and I know I did the right thing air quotes, but mm -hmm. why do I hate it so much? And then should I be okay with this? Like, and coming from a faith background, there's a lot of internal pressure in the Christian world of like, you should just be happy. You should be content. You should be grateful. So then there's this internal war of like, well, I'm upset that I'm upset and I should be grateful for what I have. And, and so I, I literally, and I talk about this in the book, there's this something I call the identity crisis intersection where yeah. we've all had a dream and it, it, it could be a big rock star dream like me. It could be a small dream. Like I want to, I want to buy my first home or I want to pay off my student loans or I want to have a kid. I want to get married. I want to start a new job, like, or move up in my job or whatever it is. We all had a dream. And then we've all had a dream die, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and it could be the spouse walked out. The, the kid got sick and died. Um, the economy went south and I lost the business. Like whatever it is, my dream, I never quite got the dream. I couldn't quite get to the, the music dream. So we've all had that dream die moment. The question is, what do you do next? Mm -hmm. At that point, I call it an identity crisis intersection because a, it's an intersection. You're going to have two choices you can make as you'll see in a minute, but it's an identity crisis intersection because when your dream dies, part of you dies with it. It's tied to our identity. That's why it hurts so bad when this dream we had is gone because part of us went with it. It doesn't hopefully define us completely, but it is part of who we are. It's not this compartmentalized thing. So it's a very tender spot and there's so much pain and sadness. So we usually choose path A in the intersection, which is to conform. You go right back to being like everybody else. And you tell yourself things like, well, that was stupid. Dreaming is foolish. Never going to do that again. Who was I to think that I could be happily married? Who was I to think that I could be a business owner? I'm never going to start another business again. That was risky. That was dumb. Whatever it is, we just go right back mm -hmm. to conformity. And that's what I did for four years. Stupid to pursue music, to think I could be a rock star, to think like, yeah, of course, I'm like most people aren't a rock star. It's not going to happen. It'd be like people who didn't get in the NBA. Like, of course, statistically, how many people actually make it to the NBA? Like, what was I thinking? And we conform. And that that's a normal path. I've done it. No shame, no condemnation. But you do have another choice. You have a choice to dream again. And what's crazy is that you could dream that same dream again, a second time, a third time, a hundredth time. It might just not have been the right timing. You could dream a different version of your dream. That's what I ended up doing. I ended up four years later realizing that I could start a, a business around music and helping musicians record and produce their own music, which turned into this big YouTube channel and this business. And it completely changed the course of my life. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if I hadn't started that thing. And I have like, a, I always say I had a backdoor into the music industry where now some of my favorite artists and producers and Grammy winners were like wanting to collaborate with me on my YouTube channel and do courses with me. And we've made money together. And I've been to events with these people that... I thought I would be there as a musician first, but I was there as a content creator, business owner first, musician second. So you could dream a new version or different iteration or evolution of your dream, or you could dream an entirely different dream. There's lots of things we dream about. And so that's the choice is don't give the choice, give into the choice to conform. Be someone that says, okay, so what? The dream died and it's painful and it's real and I'm not going to stuff it down, but it doesn't mean I'm going to stop dreaming. I could dream a new version of that dream. And I think this is a huge part of the book, you know, Cal is, is that we start, there's a five part framework and we can get into whatever you want, but we start with the, the, the R and rebel. Cause it's a, it's an acronym for rebel and the R is to resolve, to dream again. Yeah. And the reason why you have to start with dreaming or get back to dreaming is because dreams are data points. Like that's the only way to get Intel on yourself is to, what do you dream about? What do you desire? What do you want? What do you dream of doing, being, having, you need to stack this list of dreams, not so that you have a giant bucket list to go then accomplish, but so that you have a giant list of data on yourself. I think dreams are clues. There's a great verse in Psalm 37, verse four, delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, the word forgive there in the Hebrew means to assign or designate, right? It could also mean to give a gift, but it literally can mean to assign. Like I gave the name Chloe to my firstborn daughter. I gave her a chore to do over the weekend. I assigned it to her. So I feel like I read that in the Hebrew very clearly as the Lord assigns desires to us. So I think our creator has put clues mm. as to how we're wired, how we're going to find the most fulfillment, and they're in the form of desires or dreams, but we don't pay attention to them. And so it's a huge thing for people to like 
get back to dreaming for the first time in decades, if it's been beat out of them or they've gone through so much pain and loss, there's external circumstances that cause our dreams to die. That happens to all of us. But the question is, mm-hmm. are you going to shut off that dream mechanism or are you going to get back to dreaming again? It's such a powerful message. And I love it for leaders because all of us have had a dream. All of us at some point have faced the dream dying in some form. And you're right. We're at this decision point. What do you think keeps most people from dreaming again? I think people are afraid to get hurt if they've been hurt before. That was me. Like I, I created a narrative in my head that like, oh, dreaming is foolish for to, it's stupid to dream because I didn't get my dreams. So I had to create some, some belief system to make sense of my circumstances, which we all do as humans. And so I shut that part off because I didn't want to get hurt again. And what's interesting, Cal, is when I started to move into um, writing books, mm-hmm. that was like just a dream for me. Like business is doing fine. Writing books doesn't make you a whole lot of money most of the time. So it wasn't like a money maker. It was just something I was like, I really want to get into writing and speaking and creating thought leadership books for people because books have meant so much to me. And I have just a beautiful history with books. So when I decided to do that, so many fears came up again. When I was trying to get my first book deal with a major publisher, it was like, it felt like the record deal thing again. It felt like putting myself out there again. Will I be chosen and accepted and like signed off on, you know, by these book publishers, just the same way it felt like with the the record uh, companies. And so the fears came up again of, oh, you don't want that pain of embarrassment again of, hey, you didn't get a book deal. You know, you tried, but you weren't good enough. So now you got to self-publish, which isn't bad to self-publish. But if you self-publish because you didn't get a traditional book deal, it could feel like a bit of a failure, at least for me. So those same fears came up like, oh, is it worth pursuing this dream? Like life's fine. I don't want to, you know, rock the boat. So I think a lot of times that's one reason why we don't dream is that we've been hurt. We've been burned. Mm -hmm. And then I think a huge reason why is because like we're so just tired in life. Like this is why we conform. We're so tired we just, it's easy to abdicate our decision-making to other people. It's easy to abdicate life goals to like, well, what is Cal doing? Like, what is he doing in his life? I'll just do what he's doing. You know, mm-hmm. um, how are they raising their kids? How, how are they thinking about their status at work? Like if everyone all around me is just staying the way they are, maybe I should just stay the way we are too. Like, and I don't have the energy or the time to even think about what I really want. So some of it's just time, lack of it, exhaustion. And then some of us have just been straight up told like dreaming is literally a thing you do when you're a kid. Yeah. And then you have to grow up and you have to right. get serious. Yeah. And what's crazy is if you think like, I think we people go, oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Or I've heard that, or I felt that except for when you start to look at the big change makers in the world, like who are the people even today who are changing the world, whether you like them or their politics or their personality, like the people that are literally pushing the planet forward, the business leaders, the political leaders, the ministry leaders, the people that are taking big risks and like changing our planet. Like I think in the history, I think of like the MLKs, I think of like Steve Jobs, you know, these days you think of like uh, Elon Musk, you think of a Jeff Bezos, you think of like people that are doing crazy big things. They're dreamers. They're, they're, they're rebels. Like they're like, well, how could we do things differently? You know, they're not like, well, I'm an adult now. I should be responsible. Being responsible never got anyone anywhere right? Being a, being a dreamer of like, how could this be better? And you could be a dreamer at your workplace. Like you don't have to be running the place, but if you could dream up with, this is actually how you get promoted is be a dreamer. Hey, Mm. I don't like the way we're doing things. I think we could do meetings better. I think we can make the product better. I think we, and I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm going to dream up some ideas and I'm going to present them to my superior and say, Hey, you're the boss. I'm not the boss, but I really care about this. I think it could be better. Here's some things I thought about. What do you think could, could one of these work? Do you have some, could we brainstorm on these? Like if you're the one presenting ideas to make the place around you better, you know how attractive that is? You know how you get brought into projects because you're the person raising their hand saying, not, I think this place is bad or here are the problems. You're saying, how could we all win better? And that kind of person is very attractive, gets promoted very quickly, gets more opportunity. So I think dreaming is how you get anything done in the world. So ironically, the adults that are making the biggest impact are the biggest dreamers with their heads in the clouds in a way. And some of their dreams don't work out. That's the risk you take. But I think it's way more, there's way more upside to dreaming than downside. Friend, I hope you're enjoying the episode. I want to take one minute to tell you about a product that I just created that I'm really proud of. And I think it can quickly help you get true clarity in life. In our 21st century social media comparison FOMO world, it's never been harder to cut through the noise and prioritize what matters most. 
But if you can get crystal clear about your deepest desires and how you want to spend your time, that clarity is a superpower in the world that we live in today. And that's why I created the Discover Your Core Values mini course. In this short on-demand course, I walk you through a proven process to help you discover your unique core values and how to make them practical for daily life. This course will make decision-making easier. It'll give you more courage, and it's gonna help you have more peace as you say no to things that are not your highest contribution. And you get all this without having to buy a bunch of books or pour out your soul to a bunch of strangers. If you're interested, you can get immediate access at calwalters.me slash course. There you can purchase just the course or for a very limited time, you can purchase the course and a one-on-one coaching session with me. This is a great way to invest in your future. I hope to see you in the course this week. Now back to the episode. I love how you encourage us to kind of excavate the dream a little bit and like mine for what's inside of the dream. Cause I think that's my temptation. My look back at, okay, mission trips. Okay. That, that didn't happen obviously. So it's like so easy just to discard the dream completely and say, okay, well then just put that to the side. But I love what you're encouraging us to do is figure out what was inside of that dream. What was underneath that dream? What does that tell me about me and my heart to go do that work? What it, so that I think is a nuance that could easily be missed. Graham, I want you to speak to leaders out there, speak to leaders who they had a dream. Maybe this conversation is making them think about that dream. Maybe they're they're starting to think about what was inside of that dream. But what are some practical next steps? So I've, I've kind of, I'm with you. I, I like this idea of dreaming again. It sounds good. But like practically, what would you have me go do to start dreaming again? Yeah, first thing I would say is, Get out a piece of paper or Google Doc and go through the 50 dreams exercise, which is very simple, but very hard. And it's simply this. You write down 50 things you want, 50 things you dream about. Uh, And I love Tim Ferriss's question, if you're ever getting stuck here, which is, if you were the smartest person in the world and it were impossible to fail, what would you dream of doing, being, or having? And you just start to write these things down. For me, the first time I did this, it took me a week to come up with Mm. 50. (laughs) My personality, I was so, I had covered up my desire mechanism so much over the years and told myself, don't focus on myself, focus on other people, just serve people that it was so hard for me to, in your words, excavate the desires in my heart. I was very uncomfortable with that word. You know, do my desires even matter? Is it okay to desire things? My worldview just kind of like beat it out of me. So for some people that maybe that's your story, it's going to be really hard. For some of you, it'll be really easy but it'll be good for you to do. Either way, you need to see it written down. No one is going to look at this. This is not, you're not going to show anyone. This is not, no one's going to judge you. You're you're going to be the person judging yourself. There are going to be things you want to write down. It might be a specific car. It might be a specific amount of money. It might be a specific like lifestyle. Like if you almost wrote it down and you stopped yourself, come on, you knew you were going to write it down. Like just write it down. It's just to get data on yourself. So you got to, and there's 50, the reason it's 50 is because you have to really sit with it long enough to like, some things are going to be right on the surface. You know, you're going to want to do. There's going to be some things though that like, yeah, I forgot about that. That does matter to me. And then there's going to be some things when you're like, stupid Graham made me try to come up with, I got to come up with 10 more. (laughs) You're going to really get to the depths of your soul of like, dude, when I was 13, I really wanted to go on mission trips. Maybe someone hasn't thought of that or I really wanted to get on a stage and speak in front of people, but I haven't, like, I'm the opposite of that. Or I, whatever it is, like, and it could be small. Like, I really want to learn to speak Spanish. Like, that's not a huge, crazy dream. Like, yeah. it's just, it's just, what do you desire to do, be, or have? You get those 50 written down. That alone will be so instructive because then you get to see, you get to hold a mirror up to yourself and say, wow, this is, these are things I want, some more than others. Some might, I'm not even sure if I want, but I thought I did, so I wrote it down anyway. And then if you do that, try to narrow it down to a top 10. If I could only have 10 of these dreams, what would they be? That filtering mechanism is interesting. You're just prioritizing and ranking, and you're telling yourself these matter more than the others. They all matter. But if you get those 10 written down, then the best part is right next to those 10, answer the question, why? Why do I want this? Not to justify it, Right. I think Dan Sullivan has this great line about desires. He's like, desires aren't needs. Wants are not needs. You you can't justify a want. You just want it. 
I just want a taco from Taco Bell. There's no need to go to Taco Bell. No one ever needs to go to Taco Bell, but I just want a chalupa, you know? So you don't try to ever justify your wants. That misses the point entirely because then you're trying to turn it into a need. It's not a need. It's just a want. Just have the confidence to say, I just want this. Um, but why? This is for yourself. Why do you want this? And this gets me back to, I think, your thing, which is very interesting, Cal, about wanting to be a missionary. Why did you want to be a missionary? That's the question. If I'm you, I'd want to ask myself is, why? What is it about missions trips that lit me up? And the more you can noodle on that in a journal prompt of, well, was it I liked visiting other countries? Was it I liked like traveling light and not having a ton of stuff. And I, I, there's nothing to really think about or worry about because I didn't have any stuff. It's just a backpack and me. I liked being outside of my comfort zone or I liked the people were way nicer to me than they are in America. Like, I don't know, like whatever it is, like that, that's where it's going to be very personal to you. That would be very interesting for you as an example to figure out what is it about missions trips that I like? And that data is sort of that sub data that could tell you, well, Maybe I should go on more missions trips in general. Maybe I can do some short-term ones more often, but also how could I recreate these other things that I like about missions trips? Mm -hmm. um, I've learned about myself that I love to travel um, and I love being in new places. I love not having stuff around me. I don't think I'm a minimalist because I, I own a lot of stuff, <laughs> but I, a part of my, my heart loves travel because it's a forced moment of minimalism where I just have, I love my carry on and there's nothing else but my carry on. Yeah. So I can just leave it in the, in the hotel. And, and I just, I feel free. And then I feel like I'm very present. And so like, I'm learning that about myself and I love, so I'm, I'm thinking about speaking on stages and as I'm doing more speaking, it's perfect. Cause I'm combining, I love being on a stage. I love teaching. I love communication. I love giving people aha moments, but I also love traveling. Like I'd rather travel across the world and speak than speak in my backyard because I love having to go somewhere. I love being in airports. I love being on airplanes. I love being in hotels. I love being in new cities, trying new food. So it's like, I'm, I'm adding all these things that I like. I don't need to do any of it. My business can run virtually without me and I can stay home in my pajamas, but I want to go somewhere yeah. because I just want to go. And I think that's important for people to know about themselves. If you could do that 50 dreams exercise, and just look at it, I think it would be very instructive. I think some things will not surprise you on the list. You're like, yep, yep, yep. But then I'm more interested in what are the things that did surprise you and what can you learn from those? Yeah, and I want to go back to something you were hinting at earlier. It's almost like, in a way, this can feel selfish. It's like, why? Why? Because you, you, it sounded like you. It was, it was hard for you to spend time thinking about what do I want? What do I want? And I go back to something that Jamie Winship said when he was on the show and it was just this idea of like our unique identity is our gift to the world. Mm. And I think it's really easy to miss that, that we're not, it seems like to me, and correct me, it seems like your message is not like, hey, discover who you are so that you can just have this insular world around you where everything is perfect for you. But actually like, think about you, Graham, like you had this desire to be a rock star, this dream. And now what are you doing? You're in front of cameras, you're speaking, you're, you're speaking into people like me, you're speaking on stages, you have a message, you're using your voice to speak to people. So it really is your gift to the world. And had you just sat with that super cool outfit in that you know office or cubicle for the next decades, I, it wouldn't have been nearly as impactful as what you're doing right now. So I think... Um, that's one thing that I, I I guess I would push back as I've read your work is I don't think this is a message of, hey, go go do you do you for the yeah. sake of you. It's you go do you for the sake of everyone getting the benefit of that. I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, that's how I end the book. And the punchline is at the, the very end, like, why are we doing all this? Why are you rebelling? Why are you finding yourself? And you're absolutely right, Cal. It's actually not about you. It's actually the best thing you could give the world is you showing up fully as you like letting the real you come out and play. Like think about how your kids would be better off if the real you comes out and plays. Think about how your marriage would be improving if you, the real you were there, not the, the curated, like, I think this is what people want from me. You like people, like my premise is that, you know, wherever you are in the faith journey, like my premise is that we are designed by a designer. And so like, if that is true, and if you were to suspend belief that you're designed, just like any like any device, any tool, anything, you're only going to make the biggest impact if you operate out of your design. 
And I think all of us have a unique design because we have gifts, we have personalities, we have a point of view. And it really is about giving the world your truest self. Like you are a piece of the puzzle. And if you don't show up as yourself, you won't fit in. You won't be able to complete the puzzle. So I want people to find themselves because they're going to be more fulfilled. And I talk about this briefly in the book, but I believe fulfillment comes when you have three things. I think we tend to look at success, however we define that as fulfillment, but success isn't fulfillment, but it's part of fulfillment. So success isn't actually the enemy. Success is really important. We want to be successful. Otherwise, why are we doing anything? I don't want my kids to be unsuccessful humans in life. You know, I don't want an unsuccessful marriage. I don't want an unsuccessful business. But success isn't fulfillment. It's just part of it. You also need to be satisfied. So satisfaction is huge. And success and satisfaction are not the same thing. I know a lot of incredibly successful people who are not satisfied in life. So those are two very different things. And we need both. But the third S that we need, which I think leads to fulfillment, is service to others. Not because we're supposed to, but because I think we get so much joy. It feels so good to do something for someone. But the problem is, is when we think we're supposed to serve, and so we get pigeonholed into serving in a way we're not wired and brings no satisfaction. So when you can serve in a place that gives you satisfaction and you can have success in your service while you're being satisfied, that beautiful triangle, that's fulfillment. And my premise is that you figure out that beautiful triangle by pressing into your uniqueness. The only way you, Cal, are going to be successful be satisfied and have the most service you could possibly have is if you figure out who the heck Cal is and then operate as Cal. So everybody wins. You get to win because you get more fulfillment. The world wins because they get what they need from Cal the way you're meant to show up. And I just think we've put these two things in separate boxes. It's like you're either going to pursue what you want or you're going to serve other people. And it's like, when did we think that those are two separate things? Actually, the best way we could serve people is pressing deeper into who we are, how we're wired, and then showing up fully as ourselves for others. And I think we live in a world where it's almost like we have to even be even more clear now than ever before because we're so aware of what everyone else is doing. And I, and I want to get you to talk about the two-way mirror. But the other day I was sitting down, it was a conversation and it was about my career. And it was this other person on the other side who was you know supposed to be kind of giving me career advice and not one question about like, what do you want? Mm. Like, what are your goals? You know, and so it was and I and I see this a lot in mentoring relationships, even you could call them coaching relationships, but I don't think they're very effective coaching relationships where it's mm. very little questions about like, where are you trying to go? And it's often a projection of where I've been and just assume yep. that that's where you want to go. So I, I kind of want to hear you talk about two things. One, I'd love to hear you just kind of explain this concept of the two two way mirror but I'd also love to hear you talk about social media because I know you've been, I know there was a period where you were like, did a year or two off of yep. social media. So I know you've been very intentional uh, and kind of perhaps wrestled with like, how does that work as a business owner who's trying to get a message out? So talk to us about the two-way wear and I'd love to hear your thoughts on social media because that, Graham, that's something I've struggled with. I'm not really yeah. on social media at all right now. And part of it is because I just feel healthier and I feel clearer about who God's called me to be when I turn down some of the noise. Wow. I mean, you just said it. That's why I think that's a good thing. Um, it's funny, the assumptions we make, I think that's part of the conformity. One of the conforming assumptions is you must be on social media. Yeah. I don't know why I, that we I ever have thought that, that conversation with myself all the time though, Graham, like even though I've kind of made that internal decision, it's still like, Ooh, maybe I should, maybe I should get back on. Maybe I should get back on. Like it's, it's a struggle. Yeah. Yeah, it's real. No, I, I I get it. Everyone's felt it. So the, I like to just tell people like, you don't need to be on social media to be happy or successful or have a successful business. So I don't know why we believe that's an assumption. I like to challenge assumptions. So maybe that's why I was meant to write a book called Rebel. Like just <laughs> prove to me that this is necessary. And if it's necessary, then I'll, okay, fine. I'll go along with it. But social media is not necessary. Uh, when I took that year off of social media, my business 5X'd. So oh, wow. there you go. It's not necessary when it comes to pursuing most goals. Um, so the two-way mirror of meaning is really interesting and I'm glad you brought it up. This is just a, a framework that I use. It's a way I think about how your exact situation is a classic example. You go to a mentor, you sit down with somebody like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing X, I'm thinking about stepping into this. What do you think? Cause you're, you're wise, right? You're looking for good counsel, right? The Proverbs say in Proverbs 11, right? Like in a, an abundance of counselors, there's safety. So smart people bring in other voices uh, cause we can't see everything. We, we miss things. There's blind spots. The, pr- the problem is, is this thing that I call the two way mirror of meaning, which is 
like a two-way mirror where on one side it's see-through if you're on one side of the glass, but on the other side it's a reflective surface like a mirror and you can't see through, you just see yourself. This is the way I think life works is when we want to do this deep work, who am I? Who is Cal? Who is Graham? And I want to look in a mirror and I want to figure this out. Step, problem one is well, I'm on the see-through side of the mirror. So I actually don't see myself very clearly. Mm -hmm. When I try to do this deep work in this reflective work, what I really see is other people. And to your point, social media has only made this two-way mirror of meaning harder to deal with, which is I see everyone else. And so that's why we default to like, well, that's how he does his podcast. Well, that's how he shows up in his position. That's how they do marriage. That's how they do church. That's how they're raising their kids. That's what they're doing for vacation. All we see are other people all the time. It's very hard to see ourselves. Then it gets really tricky when you, a situation like you described, you're like, I'm going to go ask someone that I trust, someone who knows me, who cares about me. It could be my spouse. It could be a coach. It could be a pastor. It could be your, your superior or like your boss. What do you think about X, Y, and Z? And the problem is not that they don't love you or that they don't know you, but everyone else in the world is on the reflective side of the mirror. So when they look back at you through the glass, they don't see you. They see themselves and you get a, exactly that. Like, well, this is what I would do. This is how I think about things. This is how I do it. This is why most counseling and coaching is awful because people have like their, their little tidbits that they share with everybody, their little advice, and they just want to dive right into their knowledge, their wisdom, their well of experience, as opposed to drawing the other person out and saying, well, what path are you on? Where are you at? What do you want? Tell me why you're pursuing this. What's the upside? What's the downside from your vantage point? If you had to make a decision today, what would you choose? You don't have to give them any advice if you're counseling somebody at the fir first. Like, let them come to their own insights it's because they know, we know best, actually. It's really, really weird. We do need other people, I think, to be a mirror for us and help draw it out for us sometimes. But I think you almost need to be really clear, like you said, about who you are and what you want out of life before you start to bring in outside counsel. You want the outside counsel to see blind spots. Mm -hmm. What else am I missing? You don't want the outside counsel from the start because they'll talk you right out of it because they're not you. They don't, they're not risking the same things you're risking. They're not, they don't have the same upsides that you potentially have or the same pain that you're, you're dealing with, right? So it's, that's the two-way mirror of meaning. It gets us stuck. And, and to your point, social media enlarges that problem. There's, we're seeing so many other people. So there's been seasons where I've either gotten off of social media entirely I've unsubscribed from friends and business partners mailing lists. I've, I've stopped hanging out with certain people, not because any of it's bad, but because I, I know that it's a weakness for me. And I, to your point, I need to feel healthier again. And I need to get really clear. I need to turn down the noise. There's, there's outside noise. There's even internal noise. That's the only other problem. You turn the outside noise down, you still have to deal with the internal noise, which right. is part of what we do in, in the book and rebel. Um, but there's so much noise, it's really hard to hear clearly the still small voice guiding you. Um, and so I just say, do whatever you got to do. Like, I, I, I hate social media assumptions. That, yeah, because everyone I talk to says the same thing, bro. Yeah, I kind of hate it, but you know, you got to be on it. <laughs> and I'm like, are there social media police that come and make sure that you're on? Like, what are we talking about? Like, no one has to be on anything. And there's so many weird fears there. But the more clear you are, like, for example, with my business, I run my business primarily with a platform called YouTube. I think everyone knows what YouTube is. YouTube isn't a social media platform. It's actually a giant search engine. So I, I don't interact with people. I just post content. It shows up in search and it drives leads back to my business. And I think people have misunderstood YouTube for years. It is a giant, powerful lead gen social, uh, you know, uh, search engine tool to get discovered. It's a discovery engine. So I shut off Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff for a year uh, and I just kept posting out my my videos on YouTube as as a search engine for people to search on and drive business. I didn't have to interact with a single person, see a single thing, be on YouTube or anything. And the business grew. And so that's what I needed to do because I needed to shut off the noise. I was finding myself scrolling too much. I'm unhappy the longer I'm on the platforms and I get less clear the longer I'm on the platforms. The moment I disappear, that's why people love going out to the woods, right? You get out in the nature you get out to the beach, you get up on a mountain and all of a sudden you feel like yourself again. Even I'm not a nature person, but when it's quiet and there's nothing else distracting me, like I kind of know who I am and what I want to do in life. It becomes very clear. And I think uh, 
there's a beautiful book called Stillness or Invitation for uh, Silence and Solitude by Ruth Barton Haley. And she describes our life like a jar of river water. It's all shooken up and you need to set the jar down and be still mm. for the sediment to settle. And if you sit long enough and the sediment settles and the water becomes clear, I think we would have so much more clarity if we just silenced the noise and sat long enough. You don't have to do anything almost. Just sit long enough. And then you're like, I know exactly what I need to do. I'm just scared to do it, which is totally fine if that's the reality. Plenty of us know what we need to do. We're just scared to do it. No problem. Or I don't have the next step or I need a certain resource. No problem. Then we can go find the resource. We can go get the help. But I think clarity is a lot closer than we think. If we just silence the noise and sit with ourselves long enough, we'll get it. All right. That's, I love that. And it, what I, what I love also is you're, you're really capturing some nuance here of getting really clear about who you are, what you want to do, what your dream is. But, but I know you, Graham, to be someone who is certainly asking for people to speak into your life. And and actually the book begins with John Gordon and you developing a friendship with him and connecting with him, but knowing your vision of writing books, doing more speaking, speaking to a broader audience. And so let's land the plane here where kind of where we started, where you're, you know who you are. So you kind of got this vision, but then you bring in this external person, John Gordon, you bring him up to Tampa and you start talking and through, and I want to get you to kind of explain what that conversation looked like and how it actually ended up leading to this book. And then we'll get you to talk about the book as we're wrapping up here. Yeah. So once I knew one of my new dreams was write more books and get on more stages. And I just finished publishing my first book, um, how to get paid for what you know, which is really about the business model that I've been teaching. I'm like fresh off the heels of that. And I'm like, okay, I got my book out. Um, I want to start speaking on stages. And I met John at a, at a, a Christian mastermind event. And uh, we re- I realized we had someone in common, like our the guy that signed me to my first book deal, Matt Holt signed him to his first book deal 20 years ago. Um, had a fun conversation. And I, I told him, Hey man, you know, you're doing what I want to do in 10, 15 years. I'm sure I'll pick your brain at some point. And he kind of gave me that loose, open invitation. Sure, man, here's my number. Text me if you need anything. Well, I'm on a walk three, four weeks later. And I just feel like the sense that like, bro, you need to take him up on that invitation. Like you could figure this out or you could just ask him because he's literally one of the world's top keynote speakers, sold millions of books. Like He's doing exactly what you're doing. You could shortcut the process, just ask him what to do and not do, right? So I, I messaged him and I just begged him. I was like, bro, what would it take to get like a day of your time or a half day of your time um, to teach me? I have questions about stages and author land. And like, it's a different world than coming from the YouTube land. So I'm just trying to figure that out. And he agreed to come do it, which was awesome. And so I, I had all these lists of questions I was going to ask him about. How much do you charge to speak? How, how do you craft your keynotes? Do you customize your keynotes? What kind of stages should I start with? Do you do corporate or, or conferences? Like, how do you craft the right message? Blah, 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 blah. So like, we sit down, I start asking questions. He goes, no, 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 no. Let's start here. What's the message of your next book? <laughs> I was like, I just wrote one. Like, I just, it just came out like, bro, I have no idea. I'm not down the road far enough to think about book number two. And he said, well, this is the most important thing. What's the message of your next book? And so he said, let's brainstorm. And so we spent two hours brainstorming what I could write about. And I was so thrown off because I was like, well, I, I wanted to ask him about speaking, not <laughs> writing. Um, but that's cool too, because he's written a lot of books. Okay, fine. So I'm re- thinking about things I could write about, might be interested in writing about, nothing stuck. And he finally says, bro, tell me your life story. Let's just go back to the beginning. What's your life story? Which again, I love how he's coaching me here. He's like asking me questions. He's not telling me what to do. He didn't answer any of my questions. It's a very Jesus-like leadership moment of like answering a question with a question. You're like, how frustrating is this conversation? But it's good because it gets me to think. So I'm telling him my life story about the guidance counselor, not wanting to go to college. Even when I like lost my job moving to Tampa because we were on food stamps for 18 months down here after four years of floating with jobs. And we were trying to start a church with some friends and I had no money. And people are like, are you getting a job? Are you applying for another job? And I was like, no, I think I'm going to start this business. And his blog and people were like, you're crazy. And I was telling him about all these things. And he said, bro, you don't do what people tell you to do, do you? He said, you're a rebel. And it was the, it was like one of those moments, Cal, where I was like, man, that's not language I've ever used for myself. It's not a word I use, 
But at the same time, the moment he said the word rebel, it's like I felt in my spirit, like that word defined me in a way that was helpful for the first time ever. Like I had language to use for like my story and I realized it wasn't a bad thing. I was like, oh, wait, a rebel isn't a bad thing. No, I see what he's saying. A rebel is someone who's got the guts and the courage to show up fully as themselves and pursue their dreams and try these things and be authentic even when the world is pushing back, even when the people that love you are pushing back. That takes guts. And so we talked about conformity. We talked about rebels in history. We talked about, well, how, how did you like reverse engineering my story? Like you were asking like, how, why were you rebellious? And, and how did that work? What happened when your dream died? And so within 48 hours, the framework came I pitched it to my publisher five days later. They signed it, which was wild to me because they signed me as a business author, not a personal development motivational author. And it's kind of this hybrid crossover book. They're like, when can you have the manuscript in? I was like, oh crap. I, I don't even know what this, I got to write up, figure this thing out. So it was in that moment of like, wow, I think there's something here. I always wanted to write books like this, but I, in my mind, I thought it was 10 years out. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, I need to live a little bit more life. Then I'll write these types of books because it felt very uncomfortable, felt very scary. Um, and it felt like a new thing. Here we go again. You know, people know me, like first they knew me as a musician, then they knew me as the music YouTuber. Then I pivoted into business coaching and they're like, why aren't you doing the musician YouTuber thing? You should be, no, I want to do business coaching. Then I pivoted into writing books, but at least it was a business book. And now it's just like, again, this identity crisis keeps coming up. Who am I? Who do people think I am? Am I okay if they are not loving the direction I'm going or they wanted to keep me in this box because they know me as this, even if they're not, malicious. They knew me as this. And anyone who's ever pivoted or evolved or stepped into something new when the world around you knows you as something and you do something else is hard because people are like, wait, I have no context for you as this other thing. Like if you, if you left the military and you left this quote unquote leadership space and you went and became a missionary, people would push back a hundred percent. Be like, what are you doing? And like, but, but it's, that's what they knew you as. But if you were a missionary first and you're like, I'm going to join the army, like, what are you doing? I thought you were a missionary. Like, it doesn't matter what you're doing. People are going to judge you either way. So that's why you really have to be strong in yourself. But this book was literally like the book I needed to read myself as I was writing it. Like every chapter is like, yep, this is for me. This is for me. Yeah. And they say you write the book you most need to read. Cal, this is a book I need to read every, every single year because I, I am still trying to, I'm a human. I want people to like me and approve me. I want to fit in. That's why we conform. We want to blend in. It, it brings us safety. It brings us acceptance. You know, Earl McManus says, he has a great book called Mind Shift. He says, you have to choose between acceptance or uniqueness. You can't have both. And it's like, oh gosh, I, I default to acceptance. I want people to like me and accept me, but then I won't be able to be uniquely me. And so mm-hmm. the, the, the beauty is if you press into your uniqueness and you rebel, it actually gives people permission to rebel themselves and define themselves as well. And so you, you won't be hated on for long, but yeah, that's the journey of this book in particular. And John's been a huge, you know, help and inspiration. He wrote the foreword, but it's, and even him, it bro, it's a a meta moment. Like I, I don't even have the same journey as him. Like the way he thinks about books and speaking, Mm -hmm. you know, like he's on this, he's on the road like four or five times a week. And I'm like, I can't do that right now with kids. And even once they're out of the house, I don't think I want that model. Like I'm trying to help him think about digital stuff. I'm like, bro, you should have some more courses. You should press into it. And he's launching a new community actually right now. So I, I think there's a lot of us speaking into him like, bro, you can yeah. make so much more money and speak less and charge more fees. You know, so we have different backgrounds, but even then I, I want to receive his wisdom, yes. but also stay in, on my story and my path. Yeah. And how can I, you know, receive it, but not like feel like I have to become John Gordon, if that makes sense. Wow. And you're able to filter it. Wow. It's so I was literally, Graham, I was literally just having lunch with someone and I was talking about you. I was telling them I was interviewing you and I was telling them how like I pull a lot of Graham's stuff, but also my, my life is just very different. I have a full-time job. You know, I, I, so I, it was like a moment for me too, to be like, I can learn a lot from Graham and he's really helped me a lot, but I also have a different I have a different calling. I have a different circumstance. And so it's being able to kind of take the goodness, filter it, and then of course apply it to your context. And Graham, this book is is not only the perfect book for you to write, but it's such a good book. It flows so well. There's no fluff. A la John Gordon, you get right to the point. And the exercises, you you mentioned one of them. These aren't like throwaway exercises at the end of these this different framework. These are really, really thoughtful exercises. And so I just, we like barely scratched the surface today of this book. So, uh, got like a minute left. Just tell people 
where to find the book. This will be coming out the week of the actual release of the book. So tell people kind of where to find the book, what they can do to follow you down the road. Yeah, man. Well, I'm super excited. I appreciate the words. And I, I tell people this book is, was written to be like a coaching session in a book. So if you, if you allow it to like do the work and you do the work with it, like you'll, you'll have a lot of transformation. I don't tell you what to do in your life, but I help you find out what to do yourself. And so, yeah, I, I think it's going to be useful, not just a light, a light little read that inspires you. I think it'll both inspire you and encourage you, but it'll give you the tools to go do this work. Um, you can get the book anywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million. If you go to therebelbook.com, there's a bunch of bonuses there. John Gordon and I did a master class actually teaching through the book. There's a rebel journal that you can do the exercises from the book in, a, in this journal format. There's an entire summit I did on, on bringing in a bunch of speakers. There's a bunch of content there that you get as bonuses. If you bring your receipt there, wherever you buy the book, you can buy it at your local bookstore, it doesn't matter. But take your receipt number to therebelbook.com and you'll get the bonuses there. Um, but yeah, man, I would just say do the book and uh, let me know on Instagram, which is talking about social media. It's probably the only place I hang out at the Graham Cochran. Just tag me with a book, share a picture and let me know what's your biggest takeaway. The thing that's most useful to you as a, as a content creator, we crave the feedback loop. We put a lot of content out there in the world and we don't know what parts really resonate with people. So let me know what part resonates with you and that will help me for future content books and all that good stuff. Well, Graham, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for what you do and thanks for how you do it. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Cal. It's a fun conversation. Well, hey, friend, thanks so much for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Graham Cochran. What a gift to me, just being able to explore areas of my life where I've dreamed and maybe the dream didn't work out quite like I hoped. I hope you can explore that for yourself. I hope you'll get the book. You can get it, of course, wherever books are sold. If you enjoyed this, please share this episode with a friend. And I hope you go and have a wonderful week discovering your unique qualities, discovering maybe more about those dreams and your vision for your life. And of course, that just makes all of us better leaders. And it really helps us contribute uniquely to the world. Remember, friend, that life is short. Let's go make it count.